Hey, good morning. How are you today? Woo! Merry Christmas. I am so glad to be here today. Uh, this is really kind of a, an almost overwhelming experience for me. Sunday is my favorite day of the week. Christmas is my favorite time of the year. And baptisms are my favorite thing to do. Woo! I got to do all three today. Amen. Come on. How about it? We just saw our 76th baptism for 2018. Praise God. How about that? Wow. <clears throat> I'm fired up this morning. So, man, God is so good, is he not? Is he not? He's so good. There is nothing like ringside seats to life change. I mean, this is really what Christmas is all about. I, I love the decorations. Um, I love the baking, truly love the baking. <laughs> I, I love the music. I love the, the presents. I, I love all of it. But, but this is what it's about. It's about life change. That's why God sent Jesus. He, he sent Jesus to be our Savior, to change us. And I'm just so glad we got to celebrate that today. And I'm so glad that you're here as we celebrate Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and just say, Merry Christmas. Tell him, Merry Christmas. Well, today... Today we are wrapping up this Christmas series we then call Creating Christmas, and I saw it ra said wrapping up. That's a, that's a dad vent joke right there. It's a, awesome. Anyway, but we're wrap up, wrapping up Creating Christmas. We've been looking at the Christmas story from a biblical perspective, and I really think it's important because uh, the perspective makes all the difference. There was a very successful lawyer, and uh, he had born a lot of trials and made a lot of money. He decided he wanted to impress all of his lawyer friends. And so he went and he bought the very top of the line uh, Lexus, brand new, only one in their, in their town, uh, the, 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 the best you could get, and drove it up to the courthouse. Didn't park it in a lot, parked it on the side of the road. And as he opened the door to get out, a truck came by out of control, ripped the door off his hinges, and it just trashed that side of his car. And the lawyer got out, and he said some very unchurchy words, right? I mean, he was <laughs> communicating at a very intense level, okay? We'll just say it like that. And, and as in the middle of this, the police officer came up, and he, he hears this guy. He said, what happened? The lawyer told him what happened. Then he continued to just cuss a blue streak about this guy that hit his car and ripped the door off his hinges. The lawyer said, I, I really think you're, you're missing something here. You should be very, very thankful that you're even alive. The lawyer said, what are you talking about? And, 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 the, and the police officer said, well, when that guy ripped your door off, it ripped your left arm off too. And the lawyer looked at him dumbfounded. He goes, I can't believe it. That was a brand new Rolex. So <laughs> it didn't go good first service either. Um, <laughs> but sometimes you need a new perspective. And this year for Christmas, we, we tried to dig deep into this Christmas story. See, we, we celebrate a lot of things. There's a lot of things that we, that we kind of collectively know about the Christmas story. and It's in the songs that we sing. But this year, we tried to go deep into what the Bible actually tells us about it, about how everything starts and how it, who was involved in the story and, and how all that went. The reality for a lot of people is that this time of the year is something we need some clarity on because Christmas isn't always easy. It's supposed to be jolly and merry and bright. But for many of us, Christmas is tough. Christmas is a reminder of someone that is not celebrating with us this year. It's a reminder of relationships that have ended. It's a reminder of the things that have changed. And sometimes for some of us, Christmas, it's just tough. It's hard. And particularly if in those times, I think it's important to recognize that Christmas starts in the dark. You know, our faith in, in this holiday is, is not one that is unwilling to examine the tough issues and it, it, that, that is put on pause when we go through tough times. Really, what God has in mind for us on Christmas is so much bigger than that because Christmas starts with the people who had spent 70 years in captivity, praying to God for 70 years to be set free, for God to finally answer those prayers and send them home. And he did, but they weren't free. They had to answer to a Persian king instead of a Babylonian one. They had to rebuild their houses, and they didn't have really much to do that work with. They were in a very desperate, very difficult situation. The prayers that they had prayed were answered, but not on the way. In a lot of ways, they were, in fact, hopeless. 
They were in the dark. And when we're in the dark, we often do dark things. Or at least we tend to think dark thoughts. That's the natural consequence of living life apart from hope. The reality is, is that we, you and I, were created to give glory, honor, and to worship God with our lives. And the byproduct of that is the hope that he distills within us when we do. Which is why worship is so vital. A huge part of this Christmas story, a huge part of this Christmas season is, is the worship we offer God. We are made to worship him, and when we do worship him, it begins to instill something within us. God ignites and, and sends that spark of, of hope into our hearts, and, and that hope lights up the darkness. I hope that you find some time to honor him every day, just to find one thing to be thankful for every day, one thing just to, to say, God, thank you for this, and, and one thing just to, to just, be, just be awestruck by. See, God is living and active and moving in our lives every day. If we just take time, we can see it. And when we do, it changes things. I hope you spend five minutes in your car singing ridiculous praises to God. I hope that that's a part of every day. Because when we do, God begins to work in us and change our lives. Powerful things happen when we worship, particularly when we're in the darkest of times. When we looked at the lives of the shepherds, these men who, because of what they did, they were unclean. And they were considered not worthy of God. Because of what they did, because of the families they were born into, a lot of those trades in those days were passed on from father to son. So many of these young men had never had the experience of being in the presence of God. Many of them had never had the experience of walking into the temple just because of who they were and the family they were born into. And so they were the forgotten. They were on the fringe. They were the ones that, that people put to the side. But yet... These, the least, the last, and the lost, these are who God showed up to in the field. Jesus was born, and he didn't go to the palace. He went to the pasture. And these men were in the middle of the dark, living with their flock, and the sky burst forth with an explosion of color and sound as the angel of the Lord proclaimed the good news that would bring great joy to all people. See, we are reminded that Jesus came for shepherds. He came for that person who's on the outside, who's on the fringes. Jesus didn't come for the perfect person who has it all figured out, who never got their hands dirty, who never made mistakes. Those people don't exist, but he did come for shepherds. He came for people just like you and like me. What a powerful truth to embrace. Last week we talked about the wise men. How these magi, these very well-educated and learned men, I mean, and today we have Google, then they had the magi. They were the most educated, the most well-respected intellectuals on the planet. And they had been taught about a prophecy given by Moses some 2,000 years ago, taught to them by the prophet Daniel, while he was in captivity with their king, that there would be a star that would rise. And there would be a scepter that would represent the power of the person that came under that star. And so, knowing that there was going to be so much risk, they embarked on a journey, an 800-mile journey, a journey that experts tell us would take perhaps up to two years. Every day would be a risk. Every day would be full of challenges. In two years, so many things could happen. And yet, these men who, who were powerful, who were well-educated, these men who, who were so well-respected and so influential, no matter where they went, these men put it all on the line to pursue the promise of what this promised king could offer, something that their wealth their influence, their, their education, their knowledge could not provide. And as they pursued him, 
They found him there. And when they did, they gave themselves to this tiny baby king. The reality is, is that he came for shepherds and he came for wise men. He came for us all because we all need a savior. And that is exactly who this Christ child came to be. The savior for all mankind. See, this is part of the promise that God gave to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. Before there were Hebrew people, before there was a, a, a ch- children of Israel, before Jacob had his sons, before any of these things began to happen, Abraham was given this promise by God. He says, I will make you a great nation. He says this to one man who so far his wife had been barren. He promises to take from one man a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And then here's the prophecy. All families on earth will be blessed through you. See, this is a a promise about who this Messiah would be. The promise that he would bring great joy to all people. The promise that he would bridge the gap for you and I that we could one day... When we pass from this world into the next, spend that eternity with with God in heaven. This is the reason why we have such great joy. See, Jesus is woven throughout Scripture. A lot of people think that maybe Jesus is only part of the New Testament. And some people think he's only part of the first four Gospels. But the reality is, is that from Genesis to Revelation and every book in between, Jesus is part of that story. And this is where that promise comes out. This is the beginning here in Genesis 12 of what we call our faith. And this is exactly what was required. Faith is necessary. Abram had to have faith that the promise was going to take place. And because he did, God set him up to become the great father of our faith today. But faith isn't necessarily something we often talk about around Christmas. We might talk about believing in certain entities like Frosty the Snowman or Flying Reindeer and such. But the reality is that faith is woven throughout the Christmas story. And today, we're going to talk about the faith of Christmas. And it really kind of starts when you kind of go back and you, you look at what happened in, 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 in that dark time, in that time when they were in this Babylonian captivity, the, or they were this Persian captivity. They were, they were free, but yet not free. They had to rebuild their home. They were in such a place for lack of hope. And as you read through the book of Malachi, you could get the, the, the dis, distinct impression that everybody was messing up, that there was none there that, that was following God at all. That's, that's the impression you could get. It's, it's, it's four chapters. You can go read it and see what I'm talking about. But if you read it too fast, you will not see the faith of the remnant. And this faith of the remnant was so important. It was, it's such a critical aspect for our Christmas story today because while there were certainly those who lost hope, while there were certainly those who had turned their backs on the, the promises of God and, and on the law of God, there was yet a remnant, a small group of people who held firm to the faith. And look what it says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said in his presence as they worshiped. A scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. See, these were men and women, young and old, who, who worshiped God with everything they had. It was not something they did one day a week or for a couple hours a week. It was, it was a part of their everyday being. These were people who were devoted to God. They had powerful faith. And this is what God said about them. He says, they will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. This was the remnant. And God says they're his own special treasure. See, whenever we hold on to faith, even in our dark times, God says there's something unique about that, and he he cherishes that faith. He cherishes that obedience. It gives him great honor and brings God great joy, and he counts us different. They will be my people. They will be my own special treasure. He says there's a difference here. See, it wasn't in this moment that God was distant or that his light had grown dim. But it was that 
overall, the majority of the people's hearts had drifted far from him. But as the remnant spoke, as they remembered him, and as they worshiped, God drew close to them. He, he, he began to bless them. He heard them as they cried out to him, and he brought them through those difficult years, which teaches us a powerful, powerful lesson about faith. It's that God is faithful even when he seems absent. Perhaps you are in one of those dark places. Perhaps this is the time of, of the Christmas season that is speaking most of you because of whatever you have faced, whatever you are struggling through. Last year was our first Christmas without my grandfather. I had no idea how heavy grief could be. It was hard. It still is. But if that's you, I, want, I just want to remind you of the promise that God gives to the remnant of those who continue to believe even in the tough times, even in the dark places. And this is one of the most powerful principles that, of faith that we can find in Scripture, and it's given to us by Jesus' little brother, James. In the book of James, it says this, come close to God and God will come close to you. This is one of the central truths of Scripture, that God, who condescended to send himself down to earth, in the form of Jesus, he will still meet you where you are, no matter who you are, what you thought, what you've done, what has happened. He will meet you where you are. He will, he will invade your darkness. He will bring you hope. He will bring you comfort. And even in the midst of our hardest times, he can still lead us to the path of joy. It's who he is. This is what a Savior does. And we find him through faith. We see immediately in the New Testament the faith of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now this is a couple who is well advanced in years. Zechariah in his 90s, Elizabeth in her 80s. And they had been given the blessing of, of, for all of their adult life, being leaders within the faith community there that they lived in. In fact, not only were they leaders, they were like preacher's kids. They, they grew up in the church. They came from a family of other leaders. And so they were in these positions, and they were given a lot of respect. But yet, even in their personal piety, and even though God had blessed them in so many ways, they had never had a child. Now, we can understand because... Maybe, maybe you have struggled with infertility, or, or maybe you've been close to someone who has struggled with infertility. There's a brokenness and, a, and kind of a, a really heavy burden that lies on the heart of someone who so desperately wants a child, but for whatever reason, hasn't been able to have one. And as heavy as that is for us today, then it was even greater. It was, it was kind of a sign of a curse almost from God. And here she is at the end of her life. Zechariah at the end of his. And they're still faithful. They're still bringing those hopes and their faith and their fears to God. And listen to what it says here. It says, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel of the Lord said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son. And you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. What a powerful, powerful word to be spoken. Could you imagine as a father being any more proud of, of who your son would be? And could you imagine being in a situation where God has sent his own personal angel to make sure that you got the message? Can you imagine that? It would be unbelievable. But in this time, Zechariah is 90. His wife is 88, and Zechariah's first response is, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man. 
My wife is also well along in years. Notice, man, he did not say she was old. <laughs> she was well along, and that's different. How could this be? And the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. It is he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I've said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born, for my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. I love this. Can you imagine being Zechariah? The Bible says he was overwhelmed with fear, yet he still had to ask the question. And don't judge, because you would have asked the question too. And maybe you have. Maybe you've asked all kinds of questions. Maybe science has caused you to doubt even the existence of God. Maybe you've wondered why do bad things happen to good people. In fact, maybe when you think of God, all you have is questions. And those questions can be uncomfortable, and it can be uncomfortable to talk to other people about because you're worried about what they'll think if you have them. Questions can be difficult. And those questions may have fueled your doubt for a long time, but I want you to understand something. God is big enough to handle your questions. See, God is faithful to move even in the face of our questions. I mean, honestly, if I'm 90... My wife, Bridget, is well along in years. <laughs> and God says to me, she's going to have a baby. I'm not going to ask how. I'm going to ask why. <laughs> I was like, come on. <laughs> and there's someone younger who don't need a nap. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> if you have questions, I want to encourage you and tell you it's okay. It's okay. But I would encourage you to move in faith even though you have questions. The angel said, you're going to have a baby and it's going to be a boy. You're to name him John because this child is different. See, this was not the custom of the day. The custom of the day was to name the firstborn son after his father. And so after the eighth day, when they prepared to go through the ritual and dedicate the child and circumcise him and do all the things that were such a huge part of the custom of that day. It says this in verse 59. When the baby was eight days old, they came in for a circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father, but Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What? They exclaimed. There's no one in all your family by that name. Here's something we need to understand is that particularly in this culture, women didn't speak up like that, particularly not with authority. They didn't have the right. They didn't have the voice to do that. That's not their role. But yet, she knew the promise that was given. She knew what the angel said. And when no one else could speak up, Elizabeth found a voice that she had never had. Verse 62 said, they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. And he motioned for the writing tablet, and to every run's surprise, he wrote these words, his name is John. And instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. They named him in faith, in obedience to what God had called them to. And look what happened. Not only did Elizabeth speak up, but Zechariah got his voice back. And I love this particular part because it shows me that even when we fail, faith demonstrated by obedience restores us. Isn't this good news? Isn't this good news that even when we fail, faith demonstrated by obedience restores us? I'm so glad about this because I still fail. I still make mistakes. I still do things emotionally driven that I wish I could probably get back. But even in my failure, faith demonstrated through obedience restores me to him. He loves me. He helps me come home and lifts me up. Faith is absolutely part of the story. Look at the faith of Mary. This is a powerful thing to think about. This morning uh, in the first service, we had a whole front row full of teenage girls. 
Scripture tells us that Mary was probably around the age of a middle school girl when the angel spoke to her. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Hey, let me do this. Addison, will you please stand up? Stand up, Addie. <laughs> Ain't she pretty, guys? Give Addie a round of applause. <laughs> Brad, can you imagine? The weight of the world being placed on her shoulders. Can you imagine God saying to a girl like Addison, I'm going to give you the hope and you're to carry it on your own. You can sit down. See, I wouldn't do it. I mean, she's beautiful and talented and smart. She loves Jesus. I mean, I, I know about her. I've watched her grow up. But this is the Savior of all mankind. And God sent the angel to a girl like her. He says, I'm going to do this miracle in you, and the Holy Spirit's going to conceive. And you will carry the hope of the world. And at it. Addison didn't see this coming. Mary didn't see this coming. You know what Mary could have said? Mary could have said, okay, okay, well, if you're going to do this, then um, I'm 14, 15, 16 years old, however old Mary was. Uh, how are you going to pay for my rent, God? How are you going to pay for my groceries? God, um, in, in this time, if a girl is pregnant before she's married, which was Mary's situation, in this time, people stone girls like me, so how are you going to protect me from that? She goes and said, okay, God, I'm going to carry your, your, your son into the world, but, but how, how are we going to pay for college, God, because I can't work? I mean, Mary could have had any number of questions. Mary could have said, okay, wait, 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 well, you tell me this, and, if, and then once you satisfy my curiosity, maybe then I'll consent and say, okay, God, I'll do this. No. Mary said this, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. She just believed. <laughs> she just said, God, whatever you want to do with me, I'm yours. Such great faith. See, God is faithful even when we don't have all the details. In fact, you can't take a genuine step of faith if you do. God calls us to step and take that step where we don't know where our foot may land. He calls us to do things even when we don't know what the outcome will be because it's faith to trust him and it's faith to take action. Look at the faith that we find in Joseph. Mary, who was pledged to him, she's pregnant before they are married. And look what it says in verse 9. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her, divorce her quietly. <laughs> because, honestly, that's what a good guy would do. He would just divorce her quietly, kind of put this disappointing chapter of his life aside and, and move on. But an angel of the Lord came to him and spoke to him. This is what he said. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24 says, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. He was faithful, and he got to name our Savior. 
Now, to, to understand this, we, we have to see that in this culture particularly, this is not what most guys would do unless they were complicit, unless they were part of this deal. See, by him agreeing to marry a girl that he knew was pregnant, that everybody knew was pregnant, was going to cast some shade on him. And in this community, whenever he's self-employed, he's a carpenter, it's probably something that was going to affect his livelihood. I don't do business with him, you know what I mean? She was pregnant before they got married. So maybe he's not the kind of guy you want to trust with this job. Joseph didn't care about what people would whisper. He was dedicated to faithfully following God no matter what. See, what he understood, and the thing, the reason why I believe Joseph was selected to be the father of Jesus is that, that he understood that God is faithful even when life gets tough, decisions are hard, and we'd rather take the easy way out. Joseph didn't run away from the challenge God put before him. He just faithfully obeyed, and he let God take him every step of the way. We see the shepherds, again, these outcasts who were on the very fringes of their own society, rejected in so many ways, and yet when they are presented in the middle of that dark night, out in the field, they're forgotten. They're the ones that God doesn't even care about. They're not worthy of being in his presence. The angels light up the sky, and they give them a private concert. Can you imagine what that was like? But then the angel says, go to Bethlehem. There you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The angel gives us this command. Go, go see if what I'm saying is true. Now, we don't think about it because how cool would it be if angels were to come? But the reality is they had to leave that flock behind. That was their livelihood. That was their purpose for living. That was their connection at all in a positive way to society. They left it behind. They put it all at risk just to go and see if perhaps they hadn't just had some kind of crazy dream. The Bible says they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. They didn't wait around. They pursued him quickly. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angels said about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. What a powerful thing that those who were forgotten, those who were considered the least, the last, and the lost could have such a powerful story that God would care for them for so long so much and present himself in such a powerful way. <laughs> it says, Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought often about them. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all he had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Man, that spoke. Because if God is faithful in calling the least and the last and the lost, if God is faithful and loves us enough to, co to come for shepherds, then that means there's hope for us all. And by all, I mean all. The wise men on their journey was incredible. 800 miles, two years, great risk just to see if a prophecy could ring true. They showed up, Matthew 2, 2, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his stars arose, and we have come to worship him. They came with this excitement. Where's he at? I want to see him. Should have struck them as odd that no one else was looking. It should have struck them as odd that no one else had seen the star, but it didn't. They were deeply desirous to see this king. Because he represented something that even they with their highly exalted status, could not obtain. See, God is faithful in calling the elite, the entitled, and the extraordinary as well. The gift of Christmas is truly for all people. For those as high as the beggar on a street and those as low as the king on a throne, no matter who we think we might be, we need a Savior and we have one. 
And the powerful thing that we see in all of these stories is if we want to find him, the essential element is humility. You see it within these wise men as they not only took the journey, but then after they met him, they, they offered their worship and they offered their gifts. And then it says, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them a dream not to return to Herod. They could have went a different way. They could have said, hey, we're called the wise men for a reason. I don't need a weird dream to tell me how to get home. But they pursued him. They humbled themselves enough to follow what he had told them. And it saved their lives. And, and it likely brought hope to many other people as well. He gave them a brand new direction. And see, this isn't just the story of some teenagers who God entrusted. And it's not just a story of a remnant. And it's not just the story of shepherds and wise men. This is the story of us. This is the story of all of us. Life is a journey. To get where we're going, there's some turns that we've got to take. We must make them along the way, and God leads us in those changes. He gives us what we need to become the people that he has called us to be. And that's why celebrating Christmas is itself an act of faith. It's not about belief in some ancient jolly elf. It's not about in the way we've commercialized December 25th. It's about the journey of our lives and the transformation that it brings when we follow him. Christmas was never meant to be a one-day observation. Rather, it's the celebration of the gift of abundance of life that God gave us through the Christ child. Billy Graham said the very purpose of Christ coming into the world was that he might offer up his life as a sacrifice for the sins of men. He came to die. This is the heart of Christmas. And that's why we can have joy. Even in the dark times, even in the pain, even in the loss, we can have real, true joy. Not happiness. When the Bible describes joy, it's not, it's not talking about that fleeting emotion that changes with our circumstances. It's talking about the, 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 the joy that can come with, with knowing that no matter what happens, we have a Savior. No matter what happens, we have the promise and the hope of heaven. That no matter what happens to us on earth, whether we lose it all or we gain it all, it means nothing because we have a Savior. The hope of heaven, the salvation that only Jesus Christ can bring. And when we have that, it shapes the way we live our day to day. It shapes the way we raise the next generation. Hope is built in. Joy flows out of that hope. So we should have joy. Unspeakable joy. That the world may know why we truly celebrate at Christmas. And that because of who Jesus is, that they have every reason to celebrate too. This morning as we close this service, I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to close in worship. And maybe there's a few of you that are here today and you haven't experienced this joy because you've never made that decision to follow Christ. This morning we had people in first service that came and they gave their hearts to Jesus. Maybe today you could give yourself the greatest Christmas present ever by accepting Christ as your Savior. Maybe today you need help and you just need God to reach down to where you're at in your pew and just grab your heart and he just could hug you and you could feel the presence of God on you today. But we're going to sing and we're going to worship. Well, let's, let's pray before we do. Heavenly Father, it's this morning, God, we ask that you would just speak to us. God, that as we sing, you would inhabit the praises of your people and you would draw our hearts close to you. God, I want to pray first for that person who feels so, 
so, so desperate right now. They're struggling. They may be dealing with loss. They may deal, be dealing with hurt. And God, they've known you. But Father, they need a special touch for you right now. I pray right now that you would just, just wrap your arms around them. God, and make your powerful presence known. God, remind them of the truth and the power and the promise. God, build within them the hope that they need. God, for that person this morning who says, I've never really given my life to Jesus. And I want the hope that he offers. Just pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I know I need you. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I've messed up. And I need your forgiveness today. Father, will you forgive me? Will you be my Savior? I want you to be my king, and I want to follow you from this point forward. Thank you for sending Jesus to live and die and rise again for me. You are my king. Thank you for saving me. If you prayed that prayer this morning, can I just see your hand? Can I see your hands? Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Let's give a round of applause for celebrating God's gift. And let us sing and worship God this morning. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that you gave the Christ child for us. We thank you for the hope that you shine into our darkness. The joy that you bring that eclipses our pain. The hope we have in you. God, be with us this season, this Christmas time. God, may our lives give you honor and glory. And God, may we see many more come to you. We love you, Jesus. And then we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you made a decision for Christ today and you would still like to be baptized, we can baptize you right now. Come on, talk to one of our pastors. Grace and peace. Merry Christmas.